Right, uh, so welcome back everyone to Psychology on Demand. Um, so today I've got with me uh, Nick Gray, so uh, consultant, psychologist, lecturer and author, if I've got all, all your main roles right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's all fine, James, thank you. <laughs> okay, it was lovely to have you on. Um, and today I've got a couple of questions for you, um, things that I think kind of my viewers might really want to know about PTSD, um, and, and really starting to get a bit of an understanding and, and, and working together to kind of um, help the audience understand a bit more. Um, I think that would be great. Um, so, yeah, so just get started. So oh, Great. Thank you for yeah. inviting me. Happy, yeah. to, happy to, uh, to, to talk, that's for sure. Perfect. Excellent. Um, well, yeah, thank you for coming on. Um, so really what I wanted, what I like to understand a little bit is what got you into um into kind of being a therapist what what are kind of the origins um for you and also more specifically trauma work what made that kind of a speciality speciality area of interest for for yourself no sure and of course you know you, you're only getting my kind of surface story on this and that you know other people might think other things from if they know me or things like that but my my um, <coughs> excuse me, where I started actually my first um, job in psychology after graduating and sort of after graduating I thought well I've done all this learning it would make sense to try and carry it on and I wanted to do something useful with it and my first job uh, that I finally got um, kind of uh, after that was actually the Spinal Injury Centre at Stoke Mandeville Hospital so I was working a lot with uh, it, it was as a kind of sort of assistant psychologist, research assistant on how people have had a spinal injury kind of cope um, psychologically in particular um, and uh, working a lot, particularly with young men who had been in motorcycle accidents or diving accidents. And, you know, there was a w wide, wider range of uh, people as well. But it was, I think, some of the kind of the young men who were quite similar in age or kind of you know, I could almost like see myself in, you know, their position, really, um, just about the variations in how people coped and the variations in how people kind of, and, and that was just fascinating, like how, how are people seeing ostensibly similar situations in such different ways and how can I help people kind of, you know, uh, take a, almost a kind of, for them, a sort of a, you know, live the life that they want, the, that path to recovery. And it was a really... Um, really interesting place to to be in but also really kind of inspiring seeing people change and improve and and have very different lives but still really fulfilling lives as well um and and I think from there that's when I kind of thought well this sort of area this sort of area of kind of uh you know traumatic events kind of major changes in people's lives how do we make sense of that how do we kind of continue on live live valued lives at that point um really kind of sort of i think sort of sort of set in and that was sort of pre sort of pre-clinical training and then after training i had the opportunity to um kind of work part-time in my first job after clinical training um at the traumatic stress clinic in uh in camden um and and then that was just a, a kind of a whole other eye opener. I sort of went into it thinking, well, this is, uh, you know, well, it's it's a, a a little bit of what I've kind of worked with. And in training, I worked in neuropsych rehab, which is also thinking about traumatic events and the impact of trauma. Um, but then actually being in the situation of kind of trying to provide, uh, you know, psychological therapy for people with PTSD and other uh, kind of, you know, uh, reactions to kind of traumatic experience was uh, it kind of gripped me yeah because there's there's so much not just the the challenge for the people you're seeing the challenge for you as the therapist but kind of actually academically and in sort of in the research there's so much going on in terms of thinking about memory and basic memory research and how we make sense of our lives and what do we uh, kind of sort of how do we practically kind of live our lives but also the networks that we're in and how do the social networks and wider networks that people are in impact on how people understand trauma how they recover from trauma so it's kind of something that has um gri gripped me then and uh kept me uh interested ever since really 
Um, so it was definitely it was definitely back at Stoke Mandeville. That's for sure. And and a lot of, and, a, and a shout out for kind of my sort of first supervisor at the time, from whom I learned a lot. It was a psychologist called Paul Kennedy, who um, really kind of sort of uh, took a took a punt on me to kind of give me that first job, and then you know helped me learn masses in that in that first that first year really. Wow, it's quite quite a journey, and and yeah, focused around how people manage that big change. Uh, yes, yeah, can't get much more severe than, than kind of spinal injuries. And then how people adapt and change and, and work with that sounds like that was quite an important thing to, for you, kind of to, to understand and find out more about. Yeah, I think so. And, and the other thing that I'll, I'll sort of throw in because it's relevant, but it wasn't so crucial to, at the time. But it's only looking back. Um, was this was this you know and, and thinking about something that's I think really important in the sort of trauma and PTSD field now that we need to sort of understand more clearly all of us i think which is um the kind of the role of trauma-informed care which there's a lot of you know a lot spoken about in in kind of recent years in in the nhs in the long-term plan that adult mental health services should be trauma-informed and us sort of disentangling the difference between trauma-informed care which is you know uh thinking about kind of how this applies to everybody, including ourselves and follows, you know, there's some real key principles around kind of sort of choice and collaboration and safety that actually we're thinking about how we can make services accessible to people, no matter what their experiences in the past. But that's quite different. That's that's everyone. That's different from trauma focused therapies, which are for people with PTSD, complex PTSD as a new diagnosis and where we need to provide a very specific type of psychological therapy or one of a number of specific types of psychological therapy. And, and I think those things often get mixed up in people's minds, kind of trauma-informed care and trauma-focused therapies. And uh, and I think it, that's good to disentangle. And the reason that that also goes back to Stoke Mandeville is that um, when, when I was working there, it was at a time when Jimmy Savile was there as well. And he was in a variety of places, but he, you know, think back now, it blows your mind. He had an office at Stoke Mandeville Hospital. Yeah. And there was, you know, and some of this is in the public domain that, that, you know, uh, staff, particularly kind of young nursing staff were, were, you know, in my experience there, they were told that, you know, don't, don't get caught in a room with Jimmy. Yeah. And, and if you think back now, it's like we were telling staff to not get caught in a room with him rather than trying to change his behavior or trying to change the circumstance then and from a trauma informed perspective i'd like to think that that just wouldn't happen now or couldn't happen again but the fact is there are probably there are things that we know we're doing in services which probably aren't very well trauma informed yet and this is why we need to you know think about one of the first things we should be doing is making sure we're not harming anybody making sure that we're not causing further you know further trauma to people and 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 it's only as as you know the the work that I've done has become more uh sort of aligned with trying to get services trauma informed as well as where appropriate trauma focused um that I've kind of reflected back on that and just thought oh my god what you know I, you know I felt it a bit at the time but thinking back now it's it's, it's extraordinary extraordinary that, that kind of so trauma informed is the big kind of blanket of things that might cause trauma, things that ways of responding in, in across the whole of kind of the NHS, the whole. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All of the care we provide ought to be trauma informed. In Scotland, they have a large program to actually develop a trauma informed nation. Yeah, where the whole public sector is, you know, there's significant amount of kind of funding that's going into thinking about how uh, the judiciary can be trauma informed, the police can be trauma informed, as well as healthcare and education and other areas of the public sector. It doesn't mean everyone's a trauma expert, whatever that may mean, or everybody needs a trauma focused therapy. That's absolutely not the case. But thinking about how we are informed by that lens yeah, I think actually does add something to to the services that we provide. 
Anyway, that's a slight detour from PTSD, but I think it's good to work out. It's good to work out what the territory is. Yeah. Okay. So we got the map. Uh, so to hone it in a, a little bit to PTSD itself, then. So um, I, I want to make this a bit more accessible to kind of everyone who, who who's uh, kind of the all, all kinds of audience. Um, just to understand them, what what are the main kind of things that cause PTSD then? So what what kind of situations might cause it, and are there any things that people can have, or, or um, that 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 might mean that they don't get PTSD? Is there anything that would make someone more susceptible to PTSD? Yeah, so I mean the the kind of the things about the kind of the causes is an interesting one because there's kind of like if we look at all the people in the country with PTSD, what are the most likely things that will have caused that PTSD, and then we can also think about well, you know, um, if you have a certain event, how likely is it that you're going to develop PTSD? And and certain events are more likely to lead to PTSD because of typically the level of threat, the perceived threat, the kind of uh, experience during the event. So the events that are most likely to lead to PTSD are actually those events which are typically quite sexual in nature, such as rape sexual assault childhood sexual abuse those are those are most likely to lead to ptsd if experienced by somebody but if we're thinking about all of the events that are occurring kind of across the country you know certainly you know the the sort of statistically it will be there'll be kind of road traffic accidents yeah that actually road traffic accidents are, can be significantly likely to lead to ptsd particularly if people perceive that their life was in danger um and then also kind of physical assaults so the most common sort of probably across the country are uh, would be thinking about physical assaults, uh, sorry, physical and sexual assaults, road traffic accidents, and then sadly uh, kind of abusive experiences in childhood, which will cover both really sort of physical and sexual abuse in particular. Um, so those are those I think are the almost like the most common things that are associated with PTSD, the th types of things that kind of the the population out there may have experienced and uh, may have led to PTSD. Um, the things that kind of may mitigate against it, there's there's really been kind of uh, quite a lot of research looking at, well, you know, what are the risk factors? Yeah. And is it something about the kind of person you are coming into an event? Yeah. So that you're just more susceptible, you're more at risk. Is it something about that happens during the event? Or is it about what happens after the event? Yeah. And Broadly speaking, of course, you know people have their own almost like individual paths and risk factors. But broadly speaking, what the research is showing is that what happens during the event and what happens after the event is over large groups of people more important than the kind of person you were coming into the event. Yeah. So PTSD can happen to anybody. Yeah. It's not quotes weak people who get PTSD. The types of experiences during the event are particularly if you perceive your life to be in danger. If you think you're about to die or you're seeing somebody else whose life is in danger and there's that really high kind of sort of perceived threat, actually the way in which our brains are reacting, our bodies reacting, the sort of fight, flight, freeze response is <clears throat> leads to kind of actually the way in which our memories get laid down is different from and kind of normal everyday memories yeah and if during the trauma we have something that we call kind of dissociation where we kind of um you know during the kind of traumatic event uh we either have a slight out of body experience or we're kind of uh kind of feel sort of, sort of detached from things or the kind of the level of threat again is particularly kind of sort of high in that kind of moment then that's also more likely to kind of to lead to PTSD so there's something about what's happening at the time of the traumatic event during the trauma itself which is kind of predictive of whether you have kind of PTSD at a later time point in terms of the things after the event kind of there are many factors but two of the key ones I just sort of mentioned briefly one of which is social support yeah. So so if people have social support, more social support after a traumatic event, they're less likely to develop PTSD. But there's a slight nuance there, which it's not sort of almost like actual social support in terms of how many people or what they're doing. But it's the perception of that support.
So it's the individual perception from the person of whether they're being supported by others. So what we might think is, is that almost like, you know, oh, I'm being supportive of somebody is what we need to ask is actually, how can I help you? Yeah. What would be the right help for you kind of right now, rather than saying, oh, you should do this or you should do that, because that may not be perceived as supportive. It might be perceived as bossy or this person doesn't really understand So we really want to help people realize that uh, that they are you're there to help them. Yeah. And that their perception is that you are there to help them as well. Then the other thing that's really predictive after the traumatic event is that during the sort of immediately in the first few days, kind of first kind of weeks after a traumatic event, most people will have some uh, impact, some traumatic stress symptoms, might have nightmares, might feel jumpy, might feel detached and kind of cut off. Um, uh, you know, might be having kind of sort of unwanted memories in the daytime of the, of the experiences. If you believe that those symptoms mean that you're going mad or that you won't recover or that there's something seriously wrong with you, then that's really predictive of the development and maintenance of PTSD. So your perception of your initial experience, the symptoms you're having, really predicts PTSD. One of the nice things about that, of course, is that this gives us somewhere to try and intervene and, and sort of a treatment target in some ways, which is one of the most uh, widely kind of endorsed kind of uh, ways in which we kind of uh, provide help for people after traumatic experiences is give them information about what they might expect to be feeling. You might be feeling jumpy. You might be having nightmares. You might be feeling detached and numb or cut off. Don't worry about that. These are normal symptoms. They typically pass with time. And that if we provide people that information, that it's challenging some of those concerns that people might have about, I'm going mad. There's no way of recovery. Yeah. And so providing information, which is done in, in you know major disasters and all kinds of settings, is at heart really a kind of a cognitive intervention because it's trying to get at those meanings that people have about their symptoms does that make make sense yeah. um the, the one thing that i think probably we should do because we, ha we haven't done so far is actually define what we mean by ptsd mm -hmm. yeah, yeah because i think true. i think yeah. i think there's kind of uh, again there are assumptions made about mm -hmm. kind of you know what ptsd is and mm -hmm. people talk about oh yeah I, I you know i had a flashback to my boss shouting at me or i had a kind of um you know, I had a, uh, I've got PTSD to the relationship breakup that I had. And people use terms colloquially. Yeah? yeah, that's completely understandable, completely normal. Yeah. But if we're thinking about the treatments we offer and offering people, let's say trauma focused therapies, which I'm sure we'll come to, um, then actually we need to make sure we're only offering it to those people who actually um would be likely to sort of warrant it or benefit from it. So, so PTSD as a as a label as a diagnosis is essentially referring to sort of three key sort of clusters of symptoms. Firstly, um, cluster of symptoms re-experiencing, yeah. So re-experiencing, which is either having memories or dreams. And the crucial thing here is that these aren't simply you know, not being out, can't, I can't stop thinking about it. Yeah, it's not so much that it's more about these memories feel to some degree as if they're happening in the here and now. Yeah, they're not memories from the past. It feels real. It feels now. So people have this kind of sense of threat that's reactivated when the memory comes to mind. In addition to the re-experiencing symptoms, there's another symptom cluster of avoidance. And of course, that makes perfect sense. If you're having these horrible memories, which feel very real and are very frightening and have come with other emotions, shame, guilt, anger, sadness, then it makes sense. You don't want those to be triggered. You might avoid places, people, reminders of it. And also, if those memories have kind of come to mind, you might try and avoid them by pushing those, those thoughts away, suppressing those emotions. So there's avoidance of stuff out there, but also avoidance of things in here and things that kind of in the body as well. And then the final symptom cluster around PTSD is hyperarousal. And this is kind of being kind of uh, alert and watchful, even if there's no obvious need to be, or also kind of, uh, you know, jumping. And we all have a startle reaction. If, if someone, you know, suddenly comes out of the blue and taps us on the shoulder or goes boo we jump yeah 
this is this is normal we all have this but people with ptsd if that happens to them if there's a sudden noise or there's something out the corner of their eye, they jump higher and it takes longer to go back down to sort of like a a normal level again and that's that kind of sort of what's termed ex exaggerated startle response and and that jumpiness and that alertness is all part of the kind of like the the hyper arousal and if you've got sort of uh difficulties symptoms in each of those areas after a traumatic event and if these have lasted for sort of more than four weeks um then you can meet criteria for ptsd formally speaking but the one thing i'd want to say though because i think certainly there are concerns raised about kind of you know you know post-traumatic stress disorder it's a disorder but people argue well it's not really a disorder because people are you know something awful has happened to them something awful has been done to them even so it's completely understandable that they might have these reactions that's absolutely right and whether we use the term you know as a disorder or the diagnosis of ptsd the th the essence of it the thing we're really getting at and the thing which really directs our psychological treatments is what's the person's lived experience of these memories the memories that they're having of the event or of the series events or multiple events do these memories feel like they're awful memories but they're kind of they feel like past memories you know they know they happened in the past um or when they have these memories does it feel at least to some degree like it's happening again now like it's in the here and now and and that's the real kind of essence of when we need to do kind of trauma focused psychological treatments yes of course we want to think about the kind of you know the formally meeting all of the criteria for ptsd but actually that the essence of it is that lived experience of having memories that feel like they're in the here and now so so yeah so kind of defining the, what it is we're we're kind of talking about here so yeah so the the diagnosis of the ptsd the three criterions and some really interesting things there just before we went into that around how it's not about what you bring so i uh, i guess in cbt we talk a little bit about beliefs getting shook in in the process but it's more about the the sense of danger during what happens during and then i found that really interesting the bit afterwards as well so the the bit afterwards about felt support so how much they felt support they they feel they're being supported and a, and a really nice kind of thing there about kind of um asking in what way can i support you what what does that look like for you um and also how they how they uh, feel about the symptoms they're experiencing do they think they're normal? And, and so that's quite interesting as well is the importance of that part afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but and, and of course, the diagnose, diagnosis of, of PTSD, whether disorder is the right term. And, and, and understandably, you know, like you said before, it's, it's not this, it's, it's not this idea that it was something you brought that gave you PTSD. It, it's understandable. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so, so this diagnosis um in those three different in those three different categories um and i think it, it, you said about that that flashback is it is it happening again and one of those common things that we might hear is something like um they're around crowded people and they felt like that someone was behind them in the same way as the trauma or something like that like yeah it's happening again um so so yeah really good and a good way to kind of break that down and I guess um, as as we go through this, I had a few kind of uh, questions about the kind of different experience for different people. Yeah, sure, of course. Um, one area that I actually haven't looked into in any way really was, um, and only only through actually working with people do I have any ideas around this. But it was it was the different experience for males and females, whether there was any kind of gender difference. That, uh, that you've come across in research or in your practice at all yeah i mean um yes i think there there are some things that are sort of um fairly well established in the research and i'll, I'll say a bit about those but also some just observations from from you know people that i've kind of worked with as well um i think one one of the things is that you know what all the research shows all the sort of like the, the large-scale research is that 
women are kind of twice as likely to develop PTSD as men following a traumatic event. So, um, um, however, that's before the types of event are taken into account. So, um, whilst that may be the case, what is also the case is that uh, certainly kind of in, in sort of high income countries, uh, so where most of the research has been done, um, women are much more likely to be uh, sexually assaulted or raped yeah, than men, yeah. broadly speaking. And we know that kind of sexual assault and rapes are the type of events which are most likely to lead to the development of PTSD. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it raises all kinds of kind of uh, kind of questions and beliefs of people that have. And there's sexual trauma is often kind of related to a sense of shame or guilt as well. And the beliefs that are associated with those, which are all things that might be more likely to try and help almost like the PTSD stay stuck. Yeah. Um, so so there's definitely something there's definitely research that shows, you know, you know, more women with PTSD than men, and that's true across other things. But also, I think it's at least partly explained by the types of events that uh, that women are kind of more likely to experience across whole populations. Um, I think what's uh, also the case is that um, what we can see in in kind of again in clinical populations. So these are kind of uh, people who are coming forward kind of for, for treatment, um, that there are uh, kind of uh, sort of differences in often how people uh, engage with or cope with the kind of the PTSD symptoms. And certainly, again, in, you know, in, in the UK, in, in our culture, uh, men, typically speaking, aren't encouraged, although it's changing, which is great, aren't encouraged to feel their emotions or be very emotionally literate or express their kind of feelings and, and emotions and it is good that that's changing it is important that that's changing but you know for for a long time you know almost like the only acceptable emotion for a man is anger yeah and so there that's okay but and anything else well you know that's that's weak that's not being a kind of a, a, a man boys don't cry you know all of those kinds of things and so you know the types of things that kind of men and women do in order to cope with the sort of the PTSD symptoms may be somewhat different. So men, again, overpopulations are more likely to use drugs and alcohol to cope with the symptoms. Yeah, because it's it's a immediately effective, although in the long term, ineffective way of suppressing or pushing the thoughts and feelings away. Yeah. And and therefore, you know, that but that has all kinds of other unintended consequences, of course. Um, Whereas, uh, you know, again, what the statistics show is that a, a smaller proportion of women are likely to use kind of drugs and alcohol in order to kind of cope um, with those kind of things. Not that it doesn't happen, of course it does, but it's just, again, across populations. And I think that's culturally mediated about what's acceptable. It's more acceptable in the UK for over, you know, over the last 30, 40 years for women to be talking about their feelings. Yeah, than it is for men. And this is one of the reasons, for example, well, it's tied in with one of the reasons that, that you know, kind of suicide rates for kind of for men are significantly higher, that the, you know, leading cause of death of, I think, men under 40 is, is at their own hands. Yeah. And so we need to change this. There's a real imperative kind of for this. That's that's for sure. But that also will influence how PTSD is expressed and kind of how it's shown. And that does also kind of show in, uh, you know, in the, the therapy room as well. So, you know, a lot of the uh, the men that I've worked with uh, have shown a real deep sense of shame, yeah, and a deep sense of shame about being in therapy or about getting help. And the fact that they're there is such an amazing, one, it's an amazing step that they've taken, but also for some people it kind of shows their desperation. Um, but, but, but I think this is changing. This has definitely changed from when I, you know, first started working in this area i think yeah, yeah. So slightly different journeys um yeah, yeah. For, for women more likely to get the type of ptsd getting them stuck in the memory because of shame um because of the type of, of thing that's happening and the, the men potentially getting more entrenched in the symptoms because of what it's 
what it means to them to share, to be vulnerable, to process some of that. <coughs> Excuse that, me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah but I, I mean, the, the fact is, um, when when you're working with somebody with PTSD and they're sitting opposite you and you're trying to help them, actually, you're working, you know, whether it, uh, no matter what the person's gender, no matter what the person's kind of sort of cultural background, you need to actually be individual, personal. You need to try and work out and un help understand what their life has been like. And this is one of the reasons, particularly if we're working with people, you know, particularly if we're working with people from other cultures, if we're working with people who are refugees or seeking asylum or things like that, actually, we need to understand more more generally and, and not to make assumptions about how all of our either words or concepts or things, how we would discuss, will translate over completely. But probably that cultural sensitivity is something that we should be doing with everybody that we see. So if you or I are seeing kind of, you know, are seeing a, a British white man, we might be making some assumptions about the thing, some of the things that we kind of share in, in our lives and that. Those may or may not be correct assumptions. Yeah. So we're better off if we can trying to kind of hold those assumptions and just kind of really try and get into people's worlds and understand their worlds rather than us kind of imposing our own own upon it. So kind of potentially trends to keep in mind, but keeping it that really client centered. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, excellent. Okay. So, so I think um, w one thing that I've, I've kind of been researching quite a bit into is dissociation. I've read in your book um, kind of uh, in, uh, around trauma. Uh, it talks about two types of dissociation and you've mentioned previously around how dissociation can play a part in whether a memory gets processed and whether a trauma gets processed. I was just wondering if, from you what, what the different types are first in, in dissociation and, and the impact on, on trauma and treatment. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, I mean I I'll I'll certainly can make some comments, but I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, say I've got the most experience in dissociation compared to people who are working in clinics which are all around dissociative disorders uh, and things. But, but you know, the, the things that are coming up in PTSD in particular probably fall into two broad camps, which is kind of like a sort of a compartmentalization dissociation, which is where, you know, the person has the flashback and it, and it comes so strongly, it's like they're back there now. And that's, that's a kind of a, a form of dis sort of dissociation. Uh, and then there's a kind of a detachment sort of dissociation excuse me, where the person's feeling kind of like maybe feeling kind of numb, they're spaced out, they may not be kind of completely aware of their surroundings, but that may not be related to having a very raw memory kind of in their mind at that moment. Um, and, and, and this is kind of like on a continuum and dissociation is a normal experience, you know, like daydreaming or, you know, if you're driving home and you get home and you don't remember all the aspects of the journey you've sort of been on autopilot that's a again another sort of mild form of dissociation and things like out of body experiences would also come in that sort of dissociative kind of uh sort of experiences kind of continuum but in ptsd i'd be thinking and this is partly based on work by emily holmes and others about compartmentalization and detachment yeah and we need to be kind of aware of each of those because actually we're going to need different strategies for kind of then working with it. So one of the things that we're doing in trauma focused therapies is almost like trying to get the temperature right. We're trying to hit it's almost like the Goldilocks zone. We don't want things too cold. We don't want things too hot. You know, one of the things that we're trying to do in, in sort of cognitive therapy for PTSD, which is the treatment that I kind of offer people is we want to kind of have people talk about their memories in an emotionally engaged way so that we can identify key moments, key meanings and to work with those. And when we're doing this, we want people to be that phrase again, emotionally engaged. We don't want them to be completely reliving, re-experiencing what's happening. There's no, no new learning, no new processing that's going on. And that's the compartmentalization kind of flashback that that people kind of might have uh, kind of following trauma. Um, so what we want to do there is we want to try and keep the temperature a bit lower. Yeah. And, you know, there might be what other ways in which we work with that. Then we might have people write out their stories. We may talk about just certain aspects of it in terms of some of the headlines first before looking at some more of the detail. 
But what's kind of probably more common in, in PTSD treatment as a whole um, is, is that the temperature is too low, that people are trying to keep the emotions at bay. And so we need to try and in help increase the temperature. And if people are kind of particularly numb and detached, you know, and that might be that kind of detachment dissociation, we may have to work harder about how do we help people get more emotionally engaged, typically by closing their eyes, talking things through in the present tense, first person, to try and bring it to life again. But we're trying to get into that kind of, that sort of Goldilocks zone. Sometimes in, in some settings, talking about kind of like a window of tolerance. Um, from a from a kind of a CBT perspective, I, I think rather than tolerating things, what we're trying to help people do is to learn or to process. So I, I think of it as much as, so, you know, it's referred to usually as a window of tolerance. It's a window of processing. It's a window of learning. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to get into. And dissociation takes people outside that window of learning. Yeah. Either through the compartmentalization where the temperature is too hot or from the detachment where the temperature is too low. Excellent. Yeah. And, and, yes, and, and thinking about it that way, that's, that's quite interesting. I've heard of the window of tolerance, but the window of processing and, and I guess, yeah, that's what we're trying to get them to do is to, mm. to process that emotion. Um, and, and interesting to, to think about, yeah, kind of the, the two different types, how they're slightly different, and also how it's a big range all the way from driving home on autopilot all the way to, uh, you know, uh, being being in the past and, and <coughs> seeing what's around us. Um, very, very, uh, very complex thing. Um, dissociation yeah. yeah and and dissociation doesn't only occur in ptsd of course and you know so you know there are uh people you know there may people with significant dissociative experiences typically or commonly have um you know backgrounds with adverse life experiences with traumatic events but you can develop kind of sort of problems with dissociation which are not only just sort of PTSD or associated with PTSD. So that's why I'm saying, you know, look, it, it's the people who are working with these kind of dissociative experiences more generally who would be able to probably flesh this out for you even more, James. I'm coming at it from a sort of a PTSD perspective. Yeah. Okay. Um, excellent. Well, yeah, it's, it's nice to have an overview though and understand it a bit more. Um, okay. So, so, um, so I guess um, we, we've we've gone on a good journey here, kind of understanding first what it was, kind of the process involved, what brings about PTSD, what is it, is it, is it what happened, is it kind of the belief system before, is it, so that, that was that was interesting to understand a bit more. And I, I guess what I wanted to come now to was treatment. And, and this was quite, a, this was quite a, a, a tough one because I, I guess there's, there's three, three nice approaches nice approved approaches so we've got um a narrative exposure therapy which i'm pretty sure is, is on there we've got the cbt trauma focus and we've got emdr so um so we've got three different ones and in within cbt you've also got several different models as well you um uh, you have got foa and um and morellas and clark I really wanted to know your understanding, having having looked back, having worked in the field, having looked at the research, um, which one you find, which one has the best results, and which one, um, and, and and are they better in different places? Are there types of PTSD you might go for one slightly more over the other? Yeah, so it's a good it's a it's a good question, and it's a kind of a key question that kind of. Um, people with PTSD would want to know, you know, what's going to help me best and things. So, so one, one point that I just want to clarify is, is your characterization of there being sort of three effective treatments for, or three three areas of sort of treat trauma focused therapies. I think the way that the nice guidelines in England lay it out is, is essentially that um, there are two effective treatments. There's EMDR, eye movement desensitization processing, and then there's trauma focused CBT. Under the umbrella of trauma-focused CBT, there are four named treatments, one of which is narrative exposure therapy, also prolonged exposure and cognitive processing therapy, which are 
kind of key treatments which were offered in the states which where they kind of were developed and then cognitive therapy for ptsd which is probably the most commonly offered treatment um in in england certainly and has been uh kind of developed and sort of disseminated in in, in england and the uk kind of particularly um i think adherence and the originators of narrative exposure therapy might argue whether it's best characterized as a trauma focused cbt or not um I think it shares many common features and that's why it's gathered together under the banner of trauma focused CBT uh, in the NICE guidelines. Um, but, but you know, there are, there are nuances between the different types of trauma focused CBT. I think across all of these treatments, there are some common features. Yeah. And so actually, I think the similarities between the treatments are uh, as striking or as important as any differences of implementation and things. And I think that at heart, there are two key things which all of these treatments are doing. There are, there are more similarities, but two really key things. One of which is actually helping people realise that these are memories from the past. These are, these are ghosts from the past. And that what we need to try and help people do is is rather than avoid the memories it's to engage with the memory in some way whether that be in talking about it or having the images in mind or writing about it there's engagement with the memory rather than avoidance of the memory and then the other thing that's common across all of these kind of treatments is really is thinking about meaning yeah is thinking about how the meanings that people have about themselves, about others, about the world, about the future have either been confirmed or shattered by these experiences and how we can help people address those kinds of meanings. And there are a range of different types of tools or techniques which uh, can be used for that and different of those kind of brands of therapy emphasise typically one or more tools more than the others. But at heart, I think all of the treatments are helping people engage with the memory and they're working on these meanings yeah and so that's that's really what's shared now the crucial thing yeah but which one for me then yeah which one should i get which one for my partner for my child and um certainly for children i think the evidence is is pretty kind of robustly clear that actually you want to offer trauma focused cbt rather than emdr the evidence is much stronger. If a child of mine had PTSD, uh, I would want them to be offered trauma-focused CBT rather than EMDR first. It's not that EMDR won't be effective, but there's just less convincing evidence for it. Yeah. In terms of adults, um, the kind of the, the nice guidelines uh, in England suggest that EMDR uh, is as effective as CBT, except related for. Uh, combat related PTSD. Um, this is based on just a very small number of studies and I don't, I, I, I think this personally, I think PTSD is PTSD in terms of what we're working with and breaking it down by trauma type in that way is, is not necessarily helpful and certainly other guidelines in other parts of the world, the US, Australia, uh, the sort of uh, international guidelines uh, provide equal backing and equal weight for EMDR and trauma focused CBTs. Yeah. Um, there may be adherents of EMDR or adherents of one or other brand of trauma focused CBT who say, oh yes, but mine works quicker or mine works better or mine works uh, more effectively for this problem or that problem. Yeah. Um, if you hear people say that uh, and if you hear your own clinician say that, take it with a pinch of salt. Yeah. There is not good evidence for this at this current time. Yeah, none of them are quicker, more effective, uh, should be used in one particular trauma or another. Yeah. So how do we make treatment decisions? How do we make treatment? Decisions? I think one of the things we ought to do is provide choice where possible. Yeah. So to provide choice for people uh, around EMDR, trauma focused CBT, the type, different types of trauma focused CBT, perhaps. Um, and if somebody is coming to you, sorry, oh, let me just. The uh, uh, dog agrees. <laughs> uh, hello, dog. Um, so if uh, if um, if somebody is coming to you and says, I really want EMDR, mm. yeah, rather than trauma focused CBT, and you said, look, both these are effective, we can offer them both in our service. If they say, 
no, I've heard about EMDR or I saw it on this TV show or whatever, or the other way around. I really heard about kind of um, CBT or kind of cognitive processing therapy. I heard it on this podcast or whatever. Then let's go with what the person's choice is, because we're more likely to we're more likely to have an, a beneficial effect because they're getting their choice. Yeah. So that's the only thing that I think would really kind of guide things at this moment in time and 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 really be sceptical of people saying, oh, yes, this one works quicker or this one works more effectively in this area. It's just not the case. The one nuance of this that I'll kind of put in here is that um, is narrative exposure therapy as a treatment um, was originally developed uh, specifically actually for working with people who had multiple traumatic experiences and for working with people who are in low and middle income countries, potentially even treatment being offered by kind of uh, sort of non-professional uh, kind of sort of therapists, so sort of lay therapists, um, and to be offered almost like as close to, uh, you know, often people who are kind of refugees seeking asylum um, and as close to the kind of their, their sort of home as, as possible. And it's effective there. So for refugees and asylum seekers, there's some argument, a reasonable argument, that narrative exposure therapy and the kind of counterpart treatment for uh, children, a sort of a, a, a kid net, uh, might be the most effective treatments to kind of to offer uh, for people kind of with those kind of sort of histories. However, again, the, the trials kind of haven't been kind of fully done. And one of the problems with the outcome literature generally is that there aren't long enough follow ups. Yeah, that yeah. people, you know, you know, just because somebody's better after right at the end of treatment, how does that last six months time, one year's time, two, five years time? And 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 actually, uh, all of us in this field need to be gathering that follow up data more than has been the case. But of course, that's reliant on funding and things like that. So but coming that's that's a whole other issue. So sorry for the diversion there. But the kind of the, 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 the crucial thing is that, yes, there are effective treatments. Yes, you can be helped. Um, yes, you can be helped. Uh, even if the trauma or traumas happened a long time ago. Um, uh, and broadly speaking, there's nothing to choose between the sort of the trauma focused therapies because there are common components to all of them. Okay. That's really, really interesting and, and useful to know actually that they're umbrellaed. I didn't realize that. So that's nice to kind of see the lay of the land a bit more and really interesting how you pulled apart how the, the similarities. Um, but, but yeah, no, that's, that's, I, I think that'd be extremely useful for people who, who want support to, to hear. Um, and I think it's really interesting as well what you, how, how you looked at child psychology and adult psychology. And I think that'd be really helpful for some people listening uh, to this. Um, yeah, excellent. Um, right. Right. OK, so I thought I'd mix it up a little bit in interview style uh, and have yeah, something no, sure. a little bit more fast paced and uh and kind of i've called it hit or yep. miss it's basically so basically um i'm going to be just throwing some statements at you and i want to i wanted to hear if it's a hit it's a good one so just a thumbs up or uh, um it's it's just a myth it's just something that is, isn't true um of course you can follow up a little bit if you want you don't have to do that that and then just start okay okay sure <laughs> Um, so uh, the first one, um, it is important to work on PTSD, PTSD as soon as you've been through a trauma. Uh, no, yeah. that's a, that's definite kind of myth. What I would, would, would just a quick follow up on that is that well, look, formally you can't be diagnosed with PTSD in the first week, first four weeks following a trauma anyway. And what we should be doing with people following a trauma is active monitoring that we should be keeping sort of seeing how people are seeing whether they're the sort of the very normal symptoms that people will have like the nightmares or flashbacks or feeling jumpy whether those are gradually reducing yeah and if those are gradually reducing then just let them carry on in that process of natural recovery if however about three or four weeks about that time the, the symptoms are getting worse or they're not improving then we can intervene then excellent yeah perfect so um so bit of a myth there 
Let's see over kind of three, four weeks. Excellent. Um, only people who are resilient, um, who, who aren't resilient, get PTSD. Uh, myth. Yeah. Uh, big one. Uh, those who dissociate can be hypnotized easier. I don't know. <laughs> There's probably good data on this, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, this, is the this honest was a answer. bit of a curveball. Uh... <laughs> I mean, I, 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 look, I, I think my guess is, yeah, probably true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. Okay. Okay. We've got a maybe. Okay. Um, <laughs> going through the memory will re-traumatize the person. No, complete myth. Yep. Um, CBT therapists can't work with more than one trauma memory. Well, you do. Well, uh, it's a myth, yeah. but there is also a truth in that typically you're doing one at a time. Yeah. And you only may do a few, but also you can work with composite memories. People who've had multiple traumatic experiences may have a memory of the person who attacked them over a number of occasions. Um, and they can't say, oh, it's that time or that time. But what they've got is the image of the person's angry face or how they what they said. And, and that's a con really kind of like a, a composite memory. So there you're kind of working on the generalized memory or meaning. Um, and, you know, you could argue you're working with more than one. But in general, yeah, uh, people have had multiple traumatic experiences. Of course, CBT therapists will work with them. That's most of the people we're seeing. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Uh Anyone who goes to war is likely to get PTSD. Myth. Yep. Um, do, do you want Probably to follow up a little there? Uh, <laughs> just no, you've already I, explained how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there's yeah. there's lots of there's lots of good data coming out of the King's um, King's Military Research uh, Group. Uh, so uh, people like Simon Wesley and Neil Greenberg and others. There's loads of research looking at exactly this kind of thing. But no, absolutely not. Uh, those who have PTSD can be treated for free in the UK. Uh, yes, correct. They can. Um, I mean, there are issues. I mean, yes, they can. The the yes, but is there are issues of kind of capacity and demand. And, and you know, we're very aware at, at this point now, you know, December 2022 of some of the, the challenges in the NHS in, in the kind of in England and across the UK. Uh, so, uh, I'm not saying you'll get it tomorrow or the day after, but absolutely, uh, my first recommendation to people would be to seek treatment uh, kind of uh, in the NHS. And the first port of call will be in the psychological therapy services in primary care, which are referred to as IAPT services, which are improving access to psychological therapies. Yeah. And, and kind of the... Oh, I'm sure you 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 know why I put that one as the last one. Um, so yeah, accessing into getting support, I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, all the theory and understanding, but for for those who who really need that support, yeah, GP accessing, IAPT, um, and and most of them is I think all of them are self referral now, as far as I know. Uh, so just giving them a ring, looking at um your local IAPT. And getting that support if, you, if you're finding that you're struggling after that three yeah. four month point absolutely um, and the, the the one final thing i'd want to say james about yeah. about this about seeking help stuff is is that look, there's a there's a narrative at the moment and an understandable one given that in in the last sort of year um there's been a formal diagnosis of complex ptsd that's available within from the world health organization um and and some times people say yeah but i don't have ptsd i have complex ptsd complex ptsd is a subset of ptsd as a whole yeah you do need additional symptoms in addition to the re-experiencing avoidance and hyper arousal that i mentioned earlier and it's much more likely to uh, arise as a result of multiple traumatic experiences uh, particularly abusive experiences either as a child or an adult um, and the additional symptoms are around having problems in uh, kind of uh, having control over emotions, including dissociation, uh, your sort of persistent negative beliefs about yourself, and having problems in relationships. What all the evidence is, I mean, it's, a, it's a, still a somewhat controversial uh, sort of label in some areas, um, but what the research is kind of showing, and sort of previous research and emergent research now, is that the same trauma-focused therapies um, 
which are provided for kind of people who previously have just been badged as PTSD, but of course include quite a lot of people with who would now meet the label complex PTSD. The same trauma focused therapies are effective for people with complex PTSD and the same core skills are needed for therapists. But there may be, of course, a few additional things that therapists and, and people with complex PTSD may need to focus on, in particular, of course, their beliefs about themselves, their relationships and how they regulate their emotions as well. Yeah. So I, I just want to to say that, you know, it's not what we've been talking about today. I'm talking about PTSD as the umbrella term, which encompasses complex PTSD as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I uh, yeah, I, I have a video as well, defi going through those two. Um, that, that might be something if, if you, if you want to know a little bit more and, and you just want to recap on, but yeah, to be difference between the two, getting support, same techniques are helpful. Um, and yeah, um, if, if you're finding that you've got those symptoms, definitely uh, seek out some support. Um, and I think I think um, it's been really good to hear as well that it's not it's not what you bring. It's not about you as a person PTSD. It's about those really uh, tough situations um, and and how they how they leave kind of the unprocessed. Um, so yeah, um, it's been absolutely amazing having you on. Um, having your understanding of PTSD. Um, is is excellent seeing it from research point of view seeing it from a top-down point of view um before we kind of bring things to a bit of a close i wondered if there's anything you wanted to kind of you know have a shout out to any causes or, or websites you wanted to um uh say about or any kind of final comments at all uh, today um for, for therapists the the, the thing i'd recommend is the um website uh the it's uh oxcadatresources.com and that's o x c a d a t resources.com oh, we'll yeah yeah so oxcadatresources.com for therapists mm -hmm. lots of training videos lots of materials for helping people kind of with ptsd uh kind of more generally actually you know one of the things is uh that i've learned over the years in in this kind of areas that and and i think kind of ties in with things that lots of people say in other contexts as well is that well, look, you know, uh, we can all try to be a bit kinder to one another, just kind of more generally. And so, you know, if 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 we have choices, choose kindness. Yeah, excellent. Good motto uh, going forward. And uh, yeah, um, thank you uh, to my audience for for um, coming on the journey with us, learning about PTSD. Um, I've definitely learned a lot there, especially around kind of diagnosis, understanding uh the the two clusters i felt that quite i found that quite interesting i've learned a little bit there also about um kind of the the after the ptsd the importance of felt that they feel supported um and also um about um how it's how they view the symptoms that is one of the big indicators so that's been really interesting for me as a, as a practitioner as well uh, so thank you so much for coming on really appreciate it um and uh yeah if you ever want to come on again you're more than welcome to and uh yeah it's been a great, great well, look, thank you for the opportunity and um thanks for really interesting questions and the conversation james yeah, no worries. okay all right see you, see you nick uh, bye